Good evening. My name is Carmine Defilio. I am the director of the Sabanchi University Istanbul International Center for Energy and Climate, which we call ICAC. I will be hosting the webinar this evening, Outlook for Nuclear Power in a Carbon Constrained World. We have three experts to give us some ideas of what that might be and the reasons why we might see more or less nuclear power in our future. I'm particularly pleased to host this webinar as our three experts are good friends and we all participate in an energy committee of the World Federation of Scientists. They are Dr. Robert Budness, retired chief scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, who has also held senior positions with the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the US Department of Energy, and has participated in panels reviewing nuclear power accidents at Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. Professor Holger Rogner has had a distinguished career both at the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis, better known as IASA, and the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA. He currently serves as a professor at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. In addition, he is an emeritus research scholar at IASA. Holger Rogner has made major contributions to the literature on sustainable energy. He also serves as a lead author to the IPCC. Dr. Adnan Shah Eldon is Director General of the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences. Dr. Shahab Baldwin also held senior positions at the IAEA, including time serving as its acting secretary general. Adnan also serves as the, uh, served as the director of research at OPEC and has a career spanning too many activities to mention here. You may notice that I have sent out Dr. Shahab Elton's slides produced for a recent Oxford Energy Seminar. I think there can be a good reference document after the webinar. We will have two very short presentations to help set up our discussion, one on nuclear power safety and then at the halfway point, another on nuclear power economics. Our format will be questions and answers and I invite you to submit your questions as we go along. We will be monitoring them and I will be using them in our discussion. Robert, please make the presentation on power reactor safety. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Robert Budnitz. As he said, I'm speaking from Berkeley, California, where at the moment it's about 6.30 in the morning, just so you'll know that there's a big time change between me and you. Um, this is gonna be about nuclear power technology and safety. And if you start with the next slide, I'll, I'll just launch right in. Uh, I, the first slide is gonna talk briefly about the current world status of nuclear power plants uh, today. Today in the world, we have 440 reactor units operating in 31 countries. And they produce about 10% of the world's electricity. But crucially, they produce 28% of the world's non-carbon electricity. Non-carbon electricity is electricity that doesn't come from burning fossil fuels. Besides nuclear power, which is 10% of that, uh, which is 28%, the rest of it is from uh, hydroelectric, from solar, from wind, and a little bit from burning uh, uh, agricultural and, and, and uh, forest biomass. So uh, today, nuclear power produces 28% of the world's non-carbon electricity. But under construction today, we have 55 reactors in 20 countries, besides the 440 that are running. And when they're all built, uh, they're gonna increase the nuclear share of the world's non-carbon electricity from 28% to 32%, almost a third. Next slide, please. Now, everybody knows, and so I don't have to say this, but I need to say it because it's the thrust of my talk, that concerns with safety are the most important public concern, and rightly so, because the concern we have is that, and we've seen it, uh, we, we saw it at Chernobyl, and we saw it at Fukushima, that you could have an accident that disrupts the, uh, the, the reactor core, and uh, produces very large consequences uh, on-site and crucially off-site. But something that you should all know is that the likelihood of a core melt accident is objectively uh, low. It's not, it's not high, it's not zero, but it's low. Uh, 
based on the analysis that the reactor community does nowadays, we think the likelihood per reactor is about 10 to the minus five per year or about one part in 100,000 per year. And that likelihood has been falling uh, steadily over the years, but there's a crucial caveat or a warning about that. And it's in the, uh, the bullet right here. That's true unless the operating entity makes a serious error. If the operating entity makes a serious error, you can run into an accident quickly as happened at Chernobyl where they were doing an experiment they shouldn't have been doing. And that happened at Fukushima in Japan in 2011, where they placed the reactor site at a place they just shouldn't have used. It, 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 they, 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 they almost practically knew it at the time, but they definitely shouldn't have put it at that site. It was a serious error. A tsunami came and they had the big accident. So the lesson here, and it's in that middle bullet there, is that safety requires diligence and a great deal of care. But with diligence and care, we think that the likelihood per reactor is about one part in 100,000 per year. Next slide, please. But the principal concern with safety, as I said uh, just a moment ago, is that the consequences are clearly very large if you have an accident. Mainly, it's off-site contamination. And the consequences are the issue for most people. And again, that's, that, that's, that's appropriate. But there's a really important point to tell you which as bad as they, uh, they, they could be, objectively, the likelihood and the consequences are on average much lower than they were 20, 30 years ago. The consequences are lower by a factor of about 10 for an average accident than they were because of engineering advances that have been made in the, in, in, in the way these reactors are designed and the way they're operated. So that, for example, 30 years ago, uh, a certain accident might lead to a, a consequences, and today, we think those consequences are on average much less by about a factor of 10. Furthermore, the likelihood is lower by about a factor of 10 that you'll have one of these big accidents. Now, why do I say that? Why do I say the likelihood and the consequences are lower? It's because of learning from experience. I'll just give you the analog that everybody uh, understands. The likelihood of a very large commercial airplane crashing and killing the people on board has been reduced by a factor of more than 10 in the last 25 years. I hope you understand that. More than 10. We used to have crashes all the time, not all the time, but several a year. Uh, and, and, and now it's much fewer and there are a lot more planes. Of course, there used to be a lot more planes before the, before the coronavirus. And how did that come about? It came about from learning from experience. Next slide. Learning from experience. And that's why safety is improved. Uh, we have a whole lot of design improvements in the current plants because things went wrong that could lead to an accident, but didn't, you know, just things that, things that went wrong. And, um, and, and all around the world, uh, efforts have been made and, 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 and uh, successfully implemented to, to improve those things. Operator performance has improved. Operators used to make errors from time to time, and they still do. They're, the reactors are designed so that when they have an operator error, uh, it doesn't lead to disaster. But the number of operator errors is far fewer than it was before. And that's also true with numbers of, with, with maintenance errors. Now, a crucial aspect of learning from experience is, is what we call safety culture. I'll just try, I'll just try to explain. <clears throat> it's really, really important if there's a problem in a reactor that the person that observes it tells his management and his colleagues and everybody else rather than hiding it. In many cultures, we had a, uh, years ago, there was a culture in which if you saw a, a problem, you would fix it, but you didn't tell everybody else because it, it made you look bad. But it's crucial to report that. In fact, today we have worldwide sharing of experiences. If some small minor problem occurs at a reactor in California, uh, uh, very quickly, that problem is shared all around the world. And so a reactor in Russia or a reactor in Argentina or, or a reactor in Europe somewhere uh, or in China or wherever uh, learns about it and they learn to how to understand it and to fix it. So that culture and worldwide sharing experience, and that happens in aircraft too, by the way is a crucial reason for why these reactors are much safer than they were before, both in terms of the likelihood of an accident and in terms of the, of the consequences. Now, that, that, there I'm talking about the operating reactors today. Next slide. Next slide. We are also in the world designing and starting to build advanced reactors, large, large advanced reactors, similar to the 400 large reactors that are in operation. And we all understand that they will generally definitely be safer than the ones in operation. And the reason is 
The new designs avoid many of the difficulties of the earlier designs. They avoid it from the outset. Much less reliance on operators. Operators have a lot less that they, they're required to do, so there's less errors to make. They're simpler to operate because we've designed them that way. And there are all sorts of numerous passive systems with fewer moving parts. And if you don't have moving parts, uh, there's less uh, probability for error. So those new design improvements for the new large reactors that are starting to be built all around the world. In fact, uh, of the 55 that I mentioned are under construction now, that's what they are, there's these large ones. They're definitely safer. Next slide. Now, in addition, we have on the design, uh, on the design board, but uh, not being built yet, advanced small reactors. We call them small modular reactors because the idea is rather than have one large reactor on the site or two, you have five or 10 or 15 of these smaller ones, uh, small and altogether making the same electricity. And we are absolutely sure that they're even safer. And it's easy to explain why. Uh, the key in reactor safety is managing the heat that's produced by the, by, by the radioactivity, by the radioactive fission uh, uh, process, and making sure that heat uh, doesn't overheat and then cause trouble. Well, the small size means there's a lot less heat energy to manage. The small size means there's less radioactivity to manage in each unit uh, to be released if it have an accident. And the small size means the safety systems are much simpler. There are fewer of them and they're smaller. So we're convinced that these small SMR reactors, if, if and when they enter the marketplace and start being built in large numbers, are definitely going to be even safer than the ones we have now. Uh, next slide, please. The other major issue that concerned the public, and again, rightly so, is nuclear waste. All the reactors, every reactor produces spent nuclear fuel after it's used and also other nuclear waste. And go to the bottom bullet here first. Today, all of the nuclear reactor spent fuel and waste is stored on the surface. It's mostly at the reactor sites. In some countries, it's not at the reactor sites. In some countries, they've done chemical reprocessing in Russia and France and so on. And, 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 and so it's not at the reactor sites, but all of the reactor nuclear waste uh, that was generated since the beginning of uh, 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 way, way back uh, 60 years ago is all being stored at the surface. Now it can be stored safely at the surface, but it shouldn't be and can't be stored safely at the surface for thousands of years. The idea that you would store it on the surface for thousands of years doesn't make any sense to anybody. I assume everybody listening to this understands that. So the scheme has been uh, proposed in, in, in for many, many years, decades, to dispose of the nuclear waste deep upper, deep underground. And I'll go to the top of the slide. And I want to explain to you that disposal deep underground is fully feasible technically. And I'll give an, I'll just give an example. We had a proposed deep repository in the United States that has since been abandoned because of political problems. It was a place in Nevada called Yucca Mountain. And that was fully designed. A full analysis of it was done. And it showed that that repository was going to safely contain that waste for a million years. Maybe longer, but the analysis stopped at a million years because it's awfully hard to do analysis much further than that. That's very far in the future. But, uh, but geological um, formations are stable at that period. And so uh, and, and analysis has been done in Sweden and in Finland and in other countries. Uh, Sweden, uh, Finland, for example, is building one now and Sweden's uh, just getting started. Um, we, we believe the technical community that Disposal deep underground is going to be fully feasible, but the middle bullet tells the story. It's a question of political will. There doesn't seem to be, in most countries, the political will to get on with this job. And the reason in the United States, for example, is that it has to go somewhere. And no matter where you pick it, the local people say, not here. Well, some, there's somebody living everywhere. So not here, if it prevails, will prevent this from going anywhere. It, but it's not a technical question. And the last little bullet, I'll just leave you with this last, with this last thought, is it's not expensive. The deep disposal would cost less than 2% of the value of the electricity produced. That's a very low sum. You can't dispose of the waste from coal for 2% of the value of electricity produced. Disposing of that waste costs more than that. There is no other technology in which disposing of the, uh, of the waste uh, costs as little as that, and this disposal would be very safe deep underground. So it's not expensive, it's a question of political will. One last slide and I'm done. Next slide, please. So uh, there's another, another thing I wanna mention that I'll be done, and that is newcomer countries. A newcomer country is a country that doesn't have nuclear power today, 
but it's contemplating it, or in some cases, they're building it right now. I mean, it, it, in Turkey is an example. Um, they don't have nuclear power now, but they're a newcomer country. In order for a newcomer country to be able to build and operate reactors as safely as we want them to, there are two kinds of concerns. One are institutional concerns, and the other ones are cultural concerns. Institutionally, it's really important that every country have its own strong, independent regulatory agency. What the regulatory agency does is it assures that the operation is being, being done properly with inspections and reviews and outside analysis and that sort of thing. It's really important so that if something uh, go, goes wrong or something is trending towards it, attention is called early by someone that's independent. And the other crucial institutional concern is you need to participate in international institutions like the International Atomic Energy Agency in the same way as aircraft. If a small country is running commercial aircraft, we want them to be participating in the big international institutions that look after aircraft safety so that everything is shared. You need to participate. Those institutional concerns are important, but the other crucial concern are cultural concerns. There are some countries where there's a culture of corruption, and that's a big concern as follows. It's easy to explain. Imagine you let a contract to pour a whole lot of concrete or, or, or build a building or whatever, and it, isn't, and it doesn't get built right because of corruption. Somebody pays somebody a bribe, and the thing is it doesn't have the quality that it needs. That's endemic in some places, and a culture of corruption can undercut the achieving of proper safety. The other thing that can undercut achieving uh, proper safety is too much deference to authority. If the boss of a plant doesn't want to hear it, somebody down below has to be able to say and have the forum to say that in fact there's a safety concern here and I want you to pay attention to it. I mentioned that earlier. That sort of thing is what has led to the vast improvements in safety today. But if you have a problem and you can't raise it up because of too much deference to authority, then that cultural problem can also lead to uh, safety being compromised. But if the institutional concerns and the cultural concerns can be addressed, I at least, and I think there's a whole community of us agree, uh, I, I believe that newcomer countries can achieve the levels of safety that we want and, and levels of safety that are comparable to the, uh, to the rest of the world. And it's easy to explain why in, in just, just a sentence or two. Even in the, even in the small countries, there, everywhere there are cadres of very, very fine engineers, even in the small countries. And in the nuclear program in these countries, some of the best engineers have jumped in to work on the nuclear power program. So there's competence, there's technical competence everywhere, everywhere in the world, really. It's nice to be able to say that. But it's these institutional concerns and cultural concerns that need to be addressed. If that happens, the newcomer countries will produce uh, reactors that are as safe as the ones that, are, that we're operating today uh, all, all around the world. Uh, that's the end of my direct presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, that was uh, really a lot of material covered in a very brief period of time. I appreciate that. Uh, and, you know, I'll just say that what we heard is uh, from you is very different than how safety of nuclear power is often portrayed. Uh, one difference is that many people believe that nuclear power plant accidents have caused many deaths and cancers already. Uh, uh, is this true? Uh, I'm going to ask Ed on that. How does the lives lost from past nuclear power accidents compare to, say, the lives lost from generating electricity from coal? Adna? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Kama. And actually, to answer that question, you have to look at not just only accidents, but also the pollution, whether it's radioactive or whether it is uh, pollutant to the atmosphere from coal power plants, gas power plants, nuclear power plants emit under normal operations, some radioactivity. So you have to look at both of them. And if you look at both of them, the statistics that have accumulated so far point out, I'll just give a simple example. Take a small town in Europe of about 25,000. It needs about one terawatt hour per year. And per one terawatt hour a year, if it was using coal, then the total death rates per year from pollutant and accident over a period of time would be around maybe 30, maybe 25, depending on whether you're using brown coal, whether you're using other kind of coal. If you're using gas, it would drop to about three per terawatt hour per year for a small town like that. If you look at nuclear over time, both in terms of accidents and an average it out, 
you will end up being less than a one tenth of a person. That means you need <laughs> 10 towns or 10 terawatt hours to produce one fatality on average. Of course, one accident may cause 20 or 30, but it doesn't cause the hundreds of thousands that people have in their mind. And in fact, the nuclear ranks very close or almost even sometimes better than a renewable if you average it. So that's the, the picture that is the statistics tells that. And I think what Bob had laid out the reasons for that. The reasons are obvious. Even if you have one major accident, it happens every 100,000 years per reactor. So if you have a 1,000 reactor, it happens once every 100 years or so. Unless the operators make mistakes, then it becomes once every 10 years, once every 15 years, like what we have seen in Chernobyl and Fukushima. Well, thank you. Uh, OK, well, from what you say, the safety of uh, nuclear power in terms of looking at both the uh, emissions and mining and everything else seems to be a lot better than coal uh, based on the statistics that you've given. What about uh, renewable energy? A lot of ore has to be mined and processed to extract the various elements used in solar cells, batteries, and fuel cells. Um, how does that compare to coal, and uh, how does that compare to nuclear power. Holger, could you uh, maybe answer that question? Well, the mining of the, let's say, rare earth metals and other specific like uh, uh, other me uh, metals required for solar cell and other production is not much different or not different than the standard mining of iron, cobalt, copper, or uh, aluminum on the bauxite. What makes a difference for these is perceived scarcity of these materials relative to, uh, let's say, coal or uranium. But that again is we have not really explored extensively the world on these metals because until the uh, emergence of the market penetration of solar cells, that was no issue. Issue was also the same thing for batteries. I think with technology change, we don't see that as a major showstopper. In terms of comparing it to coal, I think the mining of metals is uh, definitely less a health and uh, uh, issue than, than, than coal itself. Okay. Well, uh, what about the future? I mean, we've, we've seen that these past accidents, the Chernobyl accident was pretty horrible, but, you know, uh, not as many uh, cancers and fatalities as some have estimated. The other two accidents, uh, Three Mile Island, not much at all, and, and Fukushima, bad, but still not, you know, uh, comparable to coal uh, overall. Uh, but can something happen that's worse than Chernobyl, or can we just have more accidents that are just as bad? Uh, Adnan, could you answer that question? Well, I, I think you have to look at uh, the, what, what is worse than what you design for as a worst case. And that's what right now is called, after Fukushima, it's called to look at beyond design-based accident. What is worse than Chernobyl? Chernobyl at the end, the core exploded because of the mistake that was done during the experiment that was being run. And so a lot of the radioactivity that was inside the core immediately was released about maybe five to 10% of it. And it was because of the explosion, it went far away. If you compare it to Fukushima, you had many reactors, three of the four reactors suffered core damage, but it didn't happen suddenly. It happened over a period of time because they lost power, they were trying to cool down. So they, you know, there was over time. So I cannot imagine something worse than either uh, Chernobyl or Fukushima, except in terms of the frequency. If you start getting all of these things happening all the time, then of course you have a problem. But in terms of a single event, it's not going to happen. Now, Bob pointed out that we have over experience. We can now expect that the new reactors built today, they are 10 times or more safer in terms of preventing core damage and preventing the release of radioactivity and even the consequences are 10 times less. So my answer, my short answer to that would be, no, I don't expect anything worse than Chernobyl. 
or Fukushima, we may have one or two or three of these over the next maybe hundred of years, but we will have many incidents, but these incidents will probably involve much, much less radioactive releases, especially with SMRs, as uh, uh, Bob mentioned. I'm not gonna talk about them for the time. Well, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, Bob, you mentioned about how the new reactors are, you know, much safer than the uh, uh, past reactors and the new fleets are being operated uh, much more safely. But then you go on to say that the SMR is even safer uh, than what we have now with the, with the experience and the new designs of the big reactors. Uh, could you explain why the SMR is, is even better as far as safety is concerned? Uh, thank you. I, I, I said some about it just a few minutes ago, but I'll try to provide a little more a little more detail. Uh, just to give people the, uh, the background, around the world there are about 50, 50 different projects, different companies and governments and laboratories and institutes that are designing new small reactors. And, the, and uh, the, there are, of those 50 projects, and all these reactors are small, and they're all different, but they all have one or two common features. And that is, essentially all of them, and we're not sure which of those is going to be built, but um, they all have, have a crucial common feature, uh, two of the two common features. The first is they're designed to require much, much less operator intervention to run the reactor. For some of them, unless an upset occurs uh, in the equipment, there's almost nothing for the, for the operators to do from one month to the next. They can run along for a year without intervention. And that's different than today, where our large reactors, as safe as they are, require operator intervention all the time. Uh, and, and because they require operator intervention all the time to adjust things or to make sure that something hasn't drifted and this sort of thing, because of that, there's the opportunity for an operator error, which isn't called upon if they don't have to intervene very much. And many of these designs have that, have that feature, and they just have to be uh, uh, safer because there's less less uh, um, opportunity for an operator intervention that would be an error. And then the second thing is they have much less equipment. The two things that cause, besides an earthquake or something that comes from offsite, which by the way itself damages equipment, the two things we worry about are operator errors and an equipment failure. Of course, that's pretty obvious. Either equipment fails or the operator. There's much less equipment to fail. And the equipment has been designed to be much simpler. We've learned over the last, what, 20 years or so? that some of the failures of some of the equipment are due to the fact that they were more complex than they needed to be and engineering advances, often these engineering advances aren't nuclear engineering, they're mechanical engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering. Much less uh, a problem, much more reliability, and there's a lot less of it. That taken all together has convinced the community that these designs are gonna have fewer opportunities for accidents and they're also designed so that if you have an upset condition, many of these, it takes hours and hours for the upset condition to finally reach the state where it's critical, as opposed to some of the uh, accident things, things we worry about in the large reactors today, you can get in trouble in 10 minutes or 20 minutes. And that extra time makes a big difference too. So I think it's a question, besides I mentioned before, the small ones have less heat to manage, they have less radioactivity to manage, but crucially, getting into an accident requires either equipment failure or an operator error or something. And they're much more resilient. One last thing. We have learned in the last 20 years how to design reactors so they're very, very strong against earthquakes. Everywhere in the world. And that we're, we're sure of that. You should know that the Fukushima accident in 2011 was caused by a tsunami, but the tsunami was caused by an earthquake. And the earthquake that occurred was the largest earthquake in Japan in the last thousand years. The largest, okay, in Japan. But that earthquake did not damage the reactor. It was the water from the tsunami. It wasn't the earthquake. Those reactors were designed using modern engineering uh, approaches and civil engineering. And those reactors on the seismic side were as safe as they needed to be. And that's a really wonderful uh, commendation. And that's going to be true of these two. So I'm, I, I, my whole community is convinced 
that these reactors are going to be much safer. Not there's no such thing as perfect, but they're going to be much safer. Well, that's convincing to me, certainly. Uh, Holger, you spent a lot of your career at the IAEA in Vienna, and uh, you know the IAEA has played a role to make nuclear power uh, safe. It's one of its core responsibilities. Uh, and could you say something about that? And also, did they do everything they could have to prevent any of the three accidents that we have seen, like Three Mile Island, uh, Chernobyl, uh, Fukushima? Uh, what, what can you say to that? Well, first of all, uh, it follows on what Bob and Adnan said already, learning from experience. Each accident has spawned off a flurry of activities and uh, Member states suddenly were more willing to uh, listen, more willing to work on international treaties such as the Convention on Nuclear Safety, which came after the uh, in 1994 after the Chernobyl accident. These uh, conventions, member states report uh, their progress made and the, uh, actual implementation uh, issues, and so on. That's one of the uh, key things to have the platform work as a platform for information dissemination and for the conventions. In addition, the uh, agency uh, organizes review teams like the Operational Safety Review Team also. These are international teams under the uh, auspices of the IAEA that, and that inspect reactors for their safety performance, safety situation and so on. The same thing we have for the IRRS, that's the Integrated Regulatory uh, Review System, where we, the IIA does the same thing, whether the regulator is uh, competent, whether it's independent, whether it's well-funded, and so on. And so there are a series of similar uh, uh, reviews, like the Independent Safety Culture Review, and so on. The problem really is these have to be invitations from the member states. So the IAEA cannot come in like under its safeguards arrangement to inspect the reactor for its safety issues, for safeguards and diversion of uh, non-peaceful uh, diversion of material and so on, where it has. What it could do be more and could have been avoided uh, by uh, IAE activities like Chernobyl or, or, or Fukushima? The answer is actually no. The test they did at Chernobyl was against all rules and regulations. The operator violates it. Not much can be done from the IAE side. On the uh, Fukushima issue, well, the probability and likelihood of uh, a tsunami was on the books. It was not unknown, but the local authorities did not follow up on it rigorously. Plus, of course, uh, you could have made a com uh, comment that the technology designed for the Midwest of the US, where the major environmental hazards are tornadoes, hurricanes, and similar, so you put everything essential underground. Well, if you transfer this technology to a uh, shore side with tsunami, you probably would be better off to put these essential parts uh, uh, higher up. And that what happened at Fukushima 5 and 6, where there uh, was no consequence of the tsunami. Well, that brings me to a, a, an excellent paper that uh, you, uh, Bob, and, uh, uh, and Adnan wrote on, on uh, it was published in Energy Policy, I believe. It was about uh, many topics, but it included a discussion of a new international safety regime. I'm going to ask Adnan, uh, what kind of obligations uh, that IAEA member countries have to uh, undertake to make a new international safety regime work in order to address what Holbert just said about that the IAEA did as much as they could within their existing authorities. How could the authorities be in, in, enhanced? Well, I, I think just to reiterate, uh, the primary responsibility for the safety 
of react reactors, it lies within the country regulatory and safety authorities. But remember, if there is a major accident, the radioactivity does not respect borders. And therefore, you need, just like in aviation, which uh, Bob mentioned earlier, you need some kind of a higher authority to make sure that the weaker element does not cause for the whole system to collapse. And what we advocated in our paper, that the IEA does have uh, standards, does provide training on standard, does provide missions to inspect reactor to make sure that the regulatory authority working fine. But all of these are voluntary. And what member countries have to, to commit beyond voluntary is to accept strengthening, for example, the Convention on Nuclear Safety that was uh, signed uh, in, in the middle of the 90s. They should, for example, commit and give the IA the authority to carry out inspections of nuclear power reactors that are operating in a similar way that the International Atomic Energy Agency has an authority to inspect nuclear facilities to make sure that the nuclear material is not being diverted for nuclear weapons. And if, if, if for example, the, the IEA is given that authority by member countries and they accept that, then the, perhaps these voluntary missions to inspect power reactors can be mandatory every three years, every five years, or whenever requested, and the results Member countries will accept to reveal the results. Currently, member countries have to sort of give permission to publish the results. So in a sense, you take the Convention of Nuclear Safety, which exists, but you have to make a lot of the activities within it compulsory and member states have to accept it in the same way they have accepted safeguards within the IEA, but also accepted in civil aviation, the authority of ECAO in order to prevent an airline that is not safely maintained from flying across borders. Because radioactivity can be just as damaging if it crossed borders as a result of accident, a major accident. Thank you. Uh, I want everybody to know that I've been working in the questions, so many questions that would be uh, been receiving from the uh, participants, uh, <laughs> participants <clears throat> and uh, we've gotten a number of questions that I can sort of uh, uh, individual questions that I can kind of summarize as um, in the, the following way uh, we see that so far it's been safe to store spent nuclear fuel on the surface so far but sooner or later we'll need uh, long-term uh, repositories underground uh, how do we do that? Uh, what are the best methods to store uh, nuclear waste uh, underground? Holger, could you start us off on that? Okay, yeah, well, and Bob already mentioned that the uh, technical uh, option has been agreed a long time by the nuclear community is deep geological repositories and has not been implemented primarily for political reasons, but also others. Not everybody considers spent nuclear fuel as waste. They could think that the 95% or 94% unused energy within the fuel could be a gold mine in the future. So that's why there's sort of a little bit of a, a delay and, and procrastination comes in. But eventually you have to. And there, I guess the only way forward I can see is sort of the examples of the Scandinavian countries, particular Sweden. I know this example has some cultural specificity that cannot easily be transferred around the world. But the main thing is involve your local community, involve your local community in a, in a way that it sees the best, the, uh, the, the benefits and the costs. And then they made even a competition between communities that had the suitable appropriate geology for a deep uh, geological repository to compete each other. And now you have the strange situation, one community that wasn't considered started suing. Not because somebody wanted to build, no, because they were excluded. So information, be honest, talk about the 
benefits to the community, jobs, and, 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 and the cost or risk. If you do that in an open, let's say, non-partisan approach, I think that is, for me, the only way forward. Thank you. Uh, I, I can see that some of the people watching are, are pretty uh, technology savvy because I have a question here that I don't fully understand. Uh, I'm going to ask Bob, um, what about vitrification by plasma arc? Uh, and, and brought in that question to uh, talk about other kind of high tech ways of uh, dealing with the nuclear waste. I know now down in the Ricci, we've heard about, we've heard various presentations that I didn't necessarily fully understand about uh, exotic ways to uh, uh, deal with nuclear waste. Uh, thank you. There, there are a lot of different um, approaches that have been, some of which have been fully developed by engineers, chemical engineers and so on and some of which are still in the proposal or, or, or trial stage, that would convert the form of the spent fuel or the radioactive waste from one form to another, so as to make it much more difficult for that to get out uh, when it's in a deep geologic repository. Those things have been around for a long time, and in fact, um, some of them are being practiced today. For example, in France, uh, they reprocess the waste, and the reprocessed waste um, is, is all destined to go into a glass for disposal underground. Those are expensive and not necessarily worthwhile. Let me try to explain. It wasn't very many years ago, five or 10, when the idea of disposing nuclear waste meant digging a, 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 a deep uh, mine. It's actually, the, the tunnels would typically be about as big as a, a, as a highway tunnel. And you know what those look like. And then you dispose of the waste in there in these big canisters and then backfill it with the, put the, put the dirt or, you know, whatever, rock, back in with some chemical absorbers. And those sites were few and far between. Uh, it, you had to be very, very careful to pick a site that, that would work well for that sort of scheme. It turns out that in the last decade, a lot of work has been done to try to understand how to dispose in many other sites. And today we have technologies that would enable disposal in many, many more sites around the world, in fact, around the US than uh, we thought feasible before. Uh, that, that those advances would make a huge difference towards making this feasible all around the world because it, the disposal isn't as sensitive to the particular conditions of the site. And that's because of advances in not only uh, um, uh, uh, encapsulating the, the, the waste in, in, in canisters and so on, but advances in the mining and, in, and, in, and, the, and, the, and the technologies, including deep borehole techniques and so on. So that today I'm sitting here in 2020 thinking that if I could play the movie forward 20 years, I'm convinced that many, many sites are gonna be developed and used for deep underground disposal that 10 years ago we would have thought wouldn't have been feasible because of those advances. They're advances in the form of the waste and advances, uh, I mean, the question I mentioned one thing having to do with vitrification, but there, there are several others and advances in understanding how sites we didn't used to think were feasible, we now believe it can be fully feasible. So that makes this disposal deep underground much more accessible than it used to, than we used to think it was because of technological advances. Oh, thank you. Well, I've been getting a lot of questions now that I think we're gonna to have to shift gears to answer uh, and go into uh, what might be the biggest challenge to nuclear power. Uh, for me, uh, looking at the question is being able to deliver electricity on a competitive levelized cost of energy, building nuclear reactors on time and under budget, dealing with uh, liberalized power markets that are becoming a problem for any base load power plant, and the prospects for new technologies to make nuclear economics more attractive. So uh, I'm going to ask Holger to make the presentation on power reactor economics. Thank you. Thank you. Let me go and share the screen. Okay, let me start my brief uh, intervention 
by reviewing the historical development of the global electricity generation mix and the share of nuclear power. What you see here, the electricity mix globally since the last 50 years, since 1970. And you see basically everything has been growing, including nuclear power. And if you see the yellow band here, and uh, sort of a first visual inspection suggests, well, nuclear power has after a certain growth period become uh, a constant contribution in terms of terawatt hour generated to the global energy mix. However, that has implications. If the market grows and your total generation remains constant, you fall behind. And that's shown here in the uh, curve that shows the nuclear share in the total generation and we see the fast uh, exponential increase between 75 and 85. Then it reached the plateau and uh, plateau in 95. And then a, a sliding decline until uh, today where we have some 10% of the global <laughs> market. But the share does not mean that the total generation has declined. But as uh, it did eventually in 2011, and ever since it has been undulating between 25 to 2600 uh, terawatt hours per year. So that is the situation uh, what we have now. Now 10% at the global level translates into very different uh, shares at the national level. And you see here the blue bar shows the net electricity generated by nuclear in terawatt hours and the uh, red diamonds indicate national share. And what the graph is really supposed to show that even countries with a very small nuclear generation, hardly visible for Armenia here on the screen, that can mean close to 30% of their supply system is depending on nuclear. A similar situations in Slovenia, uh, Slovakia, Belgium and Rome. The world leader in terms of shares is and remains for a while France. And uh, the point is the various countries have different dependence currently and possibly in the future on nuclear energy. The status of nuclear power briefly already introduced by Bob earlier. I want to show how the 440 uh, uh, plants uh, in operation and uh, representing 390 gigawatts are distributed. Here, the operation clearly indicates nuclear power has been the industrialized tech country's technology. About 75% of currently operating power are in the uh, industrialized countries. But that picture changes quite significantly when we look to the future in terms of what's under construction. The 54 uh, units under construction uh, uh, representing 57 gigawatts Clearly now, the momentum has shifted to Asia, not OECD Asia, and the Middle East. We have construction going on in uh, several countries, 20 countries. And what I would like to show is the green bars, which rep represents newcomer countries already concept introduced by Bob. These are countries that had no previous uh, nuclear national nuclear power programs, and all together from say right now represent one fifth of the global capacity under construction. These four are again primarily located in the East. A part of these who have a first nuclear power plant under construction, there are others with a plant order, e.g. the decision made, the political decision made to prepare uh, the infrastructure, See, we have four. And what I mean with preparing infrastructure, I mean soft infrastructure. Soft in terms of a national nuclear or international uh, or participation, international conventions and treaty. Infrastructure development, infrastructure uh, and, and, and regulatory development, a safety culture, human resource, in all NPP operation as grid issues and so on. And the countries here uh, where the decision has been made, they are more aggressively and really going forward. The other two sectors, 
uh, 10 here in the active preparation with no political decision and uh, considering energy nuclear programs of about 12 countries. These are in various stages of reviewing their internal uh, infrastructure readiness to embark on a, a nuclear power. Now the four new ones are basically balanced by several countries that have nuclear phase-out policies in place, Belgium, Germany, Switzerland, and Taiwan. Moving on, the nuclear industry has been uh, uh, plagued by never-ending uh, concerns. And these are ranged from high costs and construction delays to well, loss of confidence of investors that it is uh, safe to and risk, uh, low risk to invest in these uh, technologies. Fact is, nuclear is a capital intensive technology where most of its life cycle costs are concentrated upfront before the first generating revenues can be accomplished. So anything that affects costs or the uh, readiness can have devastating economic impacts. And you see here a number of reasons. I mean, uh, examples, flammable generating costs considerably higher than what uh, consumers expect. The Finnish Olkiluoto plan is already 11 years behind schedule and counting, and costs are expected to be triple what they were originally uh, estimated to be. What the construction costs rose from 14 to 25 billion, and the virtual summer uh, two and three were discontinued after uh, spending six billion dollars. Now these are all we call for first of a kind projects. And first of a kind projects traditionally have had some teething problem, learning problem, and so on. And you expect them to be higher, but not at that weight. And the main reason, and I say this at two bullets down, is the lost knowledge through a hiatus of two decades of non-construction in these countries, you simply lost the skills to do it right. The management skills, the engineering skills, and uh, the overall simple labor force skills. Now that is uh, something where one has to go through. I mean, through this hunt of uh, extremely high cost. Now Hinkley Point C is the fifth plant of that designed the French EPR, uh, but still they have projected costs or agreed costs of uh, 115 euros per megawatt hour, which is twice the current rate, which has been cushioned and agreed through all kinds of financial instruments that like the uh, contract for difference and so on. But construction delays and cost overruns have been common, especially in the OECD. But we should not forget there are examples of on time and on budget completions in Asia. And the commonality of these uh, positive examples is continued experience, continued practice in plant construction and operation. In addition, you have regulatory and license uh, risks. The regulator may halfway through your design uh, construction change rules. Uh, licensing may be delayed and political interference for uh, changing government. Suddenly you have an anti-government in place. All these are things that are concerned uh, in, the, in the industry. In addition, we have economic, poor, uh, market economic uh, uh, issues. And that is the appearance and emergence of uh, renewables intermittent renewables, seeking feed in tender and preferred access to national grids. Uh, that climate portfolio requirements do not really uh, include nuclear power as a low carbon uh, generation. And consequently, nuclear is often uh, uh, or not really included in receiving carbon market benefits. Also the nuclear base load and grid stability features are ignored in many deregulated or privatized electricity market. So in the end, then it seems that state-owned utility systems are best with a long-term vision rather than a myopic uh, 
profit maximization uh, approach are the best available, uh, able to rationalize dependencies of nuclear and accept high construction risk. I would also say that regulated markets are better suited for private investors, not only state-owned investors, rather than liberalized markets, because in a regulated market where the regulator determines the rate, he, uh, he or she will uh, consider the cost structure of the private sector. And if they are justified, the expenses, the rate, they can be factored into the rates. Let me show you one example of uh, impact of carbon prices on the competitiveness of nuclear power and consequently on uh, the potential to acquire uh, climate finance. What you see here, the red bars, are the uh, levelized cost of electricity of coal, coal with CCS, combined cycle gas, and con concentrated solar power. The black dashed line is low nuclear cost and the solid black line is high nuclear cost. Right now, without any carbon tax or benefits, uh, nuclear is not competitive to any of the uh, normal uh, fossil plants. If I add $10 per tax CO2, suddenly you see nuclear, low gloss nuclear power becomes competitive versus coal, but not natural gas. If I add another uh, $10 or maybe $20, you see the bars increase of the other nuclear remains constant. At 30, nuclear is certainly even with a high cost competitive versus coal and with low cost competitive versus gas. And so the story goes on at 60, nuclear power is competitive versus all other alternatives. That means everything else remains equal or constant, which it never does. So let's just for the sake of the argument say, well, innovation and other things have brought down the CSSP cost. So a static approach is very, very dangerous in this one. You have to look at the dynamics and not only for CSP, maybe also coal CCS or combined cycle can have some uh, uh, innovation and cost reductions before them. My last one slide. Let's talk a little bit about the small modular reactors that uh, Bob has already introduced. Why have current reactor sizes increased from originally four, 500 megawatts and today, I guess the real commercial market offers you 1,100 or 1,600 megawatts. It's the uh, economies of scale. A doubling of the unit size of a uh, reactor does not translate into a doubling of the uh, major components. They grow, let's say, for many uh, incidences, particular the containment by the square root of two. So that's a natural incentive to make it bigger and bigger and drive down the specific cost due to that. If we talk about SMRs, so somewhere between 20 and 300 megawatts, for which there's high expectations around the world, then we have to deal with the diseconomies. And these diseconomies, because of the small size, can be addressed through, first of all, modularization and factory build and design simplification. Basically, you produce them in shop and you deliver them by truck or rail or barge to the generation site. And that all reduces quality issues. It uses the risk of uh, project delays and cost overruns. By the same time, if I uh, have uh, fewer megawatts to finance, that lowers my economic risk exposure. And if I manage to really produce these plants on schedule and on budget, so moving down here this uh, cost uh, axis, then of course, uh, my finance also uh, will become uh, easier because we are in still investor confidence and uh, utility and the market will simply increase. Again, let's not ignore that we have the first of a current generation cost that could be possibly higher than current uh, generation cost of large new large reactors. But the real uh, benefit is 
that you can learn much faster with SMRs than with large reactors. Assume you need a thousand megawatts. That's one large reactor you learn once. If I take five 100, uh, 200 megawatts or 10 100 megawatt SMRs, I can learn five or 10 times and move down the learning curve uh, much faster. If I manage to promote and show this, then with risk sharing, vendor credits, and all these things, I can get much, much lower financing costs. So that's what we have seen in many in, uh, jurisdictions, particularly in uh, uh, privatized market, that there is a risk premium for loans on a nuclear project. You could avoid these. In addition, SMRs are well suited for small grids, in, as you find it in developing countries. It could also complement variable renewable electricity in all markets. And uh, yeah, that are sort of the, uh, where innovation really can drive the uh, cost buy down of uh, uh, SMRs. Thank you. Four essential questions that will shape the future of nuclear power either up or down. Electricity market, Will we stay in a uh, competitive or come back to regulated or partially regulated market? Ownership of generating assets. Is it public? Is it private? Is it a mix? Financing. Who can offer finance? Who is willing to offer and take on the risks? What are the risk sharing possibilities during construction, after construction, and so on? But for most important is a non-partisan public policy support and commitment. And that commitment is, yes, nuclear power is part of the national energy mix. How much, when, which technology, which design, and so on, that is out for debate. But the principal decision, nuclear power is part of the mix, should not be uh, debatable. I mean, it should not be open for debate every time around you have a new election. That really will turn off any private sector involvement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I was particularly struck by your uh, explanation of why nuclear power has not done well in competitive power markets uh, compared to state-owned systems or old-fashioned investor-owned monopolies. One thing that occurs to me about this is the uh, combination of more renewables that which are solar and, and, and wind of course are intermittent and the combination of them with competitive power grids has created more of a need for plants that used to be a uh, base load power plants to be load following power plants and uh, while I guess nuclear power plants can operate in a load following mode do they achieve any cost savings by doing that and does this mixture of uh, renewables, intermittent renewables, competitive power grids, and, and more pressure to have load following power as opposed to base load power, is that creating a power for a problem for nuclear energy in terms of uh, uh, making it be economically attractive? Uh, Hobart. For me, okay. Uh... The fact that nuclear power is a capital intensive technology. My gut feeling says, as an economist, uh, you don't want to have it load following. It can, but a capital intensive technology is supposed to generate revenue and not sit for the market to come right and up and down. But SMRs are more designed towards that aspect than the large reactors. You can do it. But I don't think that is where the real strength of a nuclear comes in. I see the strength for this, that you run your plant base load. And at valleys, because now the renewables come in on a sunny day like today here in, in Western Europe, then you produce something else. For example, you use electrolytic hydrogen production. And this kind of, in the Middle East, you would maybe desalinate water when the electricity uh, uh, demand is falling short. So produce byproducts that are storable 
I don't need the uh, timely uh, demand development. Yeah, that's sort of my take on it. I know not everybody will agree on that, but uh, if I spend billions, I don't want to sit down and wait for the night to come or the wind to stop blowing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to notice you uh, uh, were uh, on the screen for a moment. Uh, do you have anything more to say? And, and could you tell us, uh, given what uh, Holger said uh, in his presentation and his answer, is this one of the reasons we're seeing uh, more of a future uh, for nuclear power in Asia and the Middle East, where liberalized power markets are not as prevalent? Anna? Oh, you're asking me? Yes. <laughs> oh, I, I, well, I, I think uh, in the Middle East, I can speak on the Middle East. Uh, I know why the Middle East is pursuing nuclear power. Uh, originally, some 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was driven by the high oil prices, to be very honest with you. The, the competitiveness of nuclear power was very compelling 10, 20 years ago. Uh, right now, it has shifted to the question of diversification, both in terms of energy sources, but also in terms of uh, the economy. And finally, I think with the financial resources available from government to reinforce what uh, Holder said, in most Middle Eastern countries, the governments are able to take that decision. So you can see that happening. And I suppose it's the same in some of the Asian countries, not all of them. But some of the Asian countries, that's the same thing, is that the availability of funding from the government uh, can drive nuclear power much easier than in Western Europe. Okay. Uh, Bob, uh, we've been hearing about SMRs now for a long time, like being smaller and, and, uh, but, and, and all the advantages that they have. Uh, one of our uh, questions that we've received from our participants had to be about the potential for using SMRs in uh, some of the Mideast states like uh, Iran, Qatar, uh, Kuwait, etc. But before I get into that particular question about uh, the scalability of SMRs, um, I, I want to I want to get down to the question of uh, of their cost. Uh, are, can they achieve the levelized cost of energy of a large reactor? It used to be that people built large reactors because they made more sense, uh, you know, because of economies of scale. Now we're talking about building reactors that are only one fifth or one tenth the size of the big reactor. How do we get the levelized cost of energy down to the cost that you get from a big reactor? Bob? Uh, thank you. Well, this is still in the future to demonstrate, but as I said, there are 50 odd projects around the world, uh, companies, institutes, uh, governments, and so on, who are developing uh, small reactor designs, and they all have the same thing in mind. They wouldn't be doing it if they didn't believe that the, in the end, the electricity they produce will be competitive. How can it be competitive? Well, we don't know yet because we haven't built enough of them to know. That is, it's still in the future. But the promise is based on two different things, and it's easy to explain. The first is factory fabrication where if you're making 10 of them in a factory, it's a lot more, uh, it, it's much, it can be less expensive, they hope it will be. And you can control the quality better, which means that it can be, they'll be more identical. And crucially, then you build the whole thing and you transport it to the site, as opposed to the current approach where all the, all the components are shipped to a site and then you have to assemble it right on the site. And, and that factory fabrication holds the promise and we have a lot of information to support that, but it still has to be demonstrated. And the second has to do with operations. Uh, Holger showed a slide uh, that showed that in the future, we think uh, the best projection is that the, operate, the, the operations are gonna contribute about a third or maybe a quarter of the cost of generating electricity. The operations are salaries and maintenance and stuff like that. But some of these newer reactor designs have very low operating costs, very few operators, very low maintenance, it's intense when you do something, you know, for you, you shut it down and work, work like the Dickens for a week or two, and then it comes back up for a couple of years. But um, the promise that these designs are pointing towards would be 
that those costs would be would would come down uh, by a, a quarter of the whole cost, which is a big deal. If that promise can be uh, realized, and we're still in the future and we don't know yet, uh, I foresee that this is not a niche market uh, 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 technology. This is a technology which can compete fully with the great big baseload plants, which um, is the current approach, or with any other um, any other electricity generating plant. That's the promise. Um, we're going to see the first few units on the grid in the next few years. In China, uh, you know, very soon, um, around the world, certainly within the decade, there are going to be a whole bunch of them. And uh, not all those 50 odd ones are going to be built at that time, but, but several of them are. And so we're going to know pretty soon whether or not this will be true of most of them or only a few of them, or in the worst case, uh, almost none of them. Uh, we just don't know. But the promise is there on the engineering side. Okay. Well, uh, I'd like to ask Gardner, I know that uh, you and Holger and Bob are going to be presenting something at the G20 meeting in uh, Riyadh this November. As I understand it, uh, you're all making an invention to keep nuclear as part of the fight against climate change. I noticed uh, on uh, Holger's presentation, he was showing the benefits to nuclear power of a $60 per ton uh, value for uh, carbon emissions. I think uh, probably the number is a lot higher than $60 a ton to achieve uh, two degrees or a degree and a half. The price is probably cost of carbon or the value of carbon is probably more like $100 or $150 a ton, not $60 a ton. So having uh, electricity that has uh, very low carbon emissions is to be highly valued. Uh, and so this intervention uh, should be important. Could, it, could you tell us about your plans for G20 uh, to accomplish this? And what influence do you all hope to have in achieving your presentation there? Well, uh, our presentation is part of what's called the Task Force 2, which is uh, climate change. And uh, there, there are, in addition to our presentation, which has been accepted for the time being, uh, uh, there are another 25 uh, policy briefs on climate uh, change and what to do about climate change, including hydrogen. So that's one thing. But, but these are part of what's called the think tank's contribution to the G20. You know, the G20 is a process, is an annual process hosted by one of the G20 countries. And they have committed themselves to accepting input from think tanks and civil society. And so we were asked to write a paper along the lines of our paper a few years ago uh, to convince the G20 ultimately that there are reasons why nuclear should be kept. And the reasons are the following, and we make it very simple. If you look at the IPCC report, uh, trying to keep the world at less than two degrees or less than 1.5 degrees, there are many energy pathways that have been investigated by the latest IPCC reports. All of them require not only nuclear, not only fossil with CCS, but they require carbon dioxide remover from the atmosphere directly. And that's a technology that is being developed. Now, if that technology does not materialize, we make the point, if that technology does not materialize, nuclear is there to expand because it's mature, it's safe, as we have pointed out. Now, the issue of the economics, yes, of course, the issue of the economics. And that's why we think SMR has a big role to play. And I think, I wanted to add to what Bob said earlier about SMR, and, and we make that point, is that governments can support SMR much easier than supporting new large-scale uh, power plants, because light water reactors, large one, cost 5 billion, 10 billion. A small 100 megawatt, 200 megawatt, will cost maybe not one-tenth of that, but you can learn much faster, as Holger mentioned. Now, ultimately, the T20 process will end up with a communique, and we hope that in that communique, nuclear will be endorsed. We made four proposals in, in our paper. I don't want to uh, labor them. One of them is about improving the international safety regime. One of them is to support SMR, 
and the other one is to really make the playing field levelized with nuclear because currently as Holder said, the nuclear is being ignored despite its good credentials. So hopefully in November in Riyadh, our policy brief will filter into the final communique of the T20 and will be in front of those countries. Not all of them will support nuclear. We know Germany will not and few other European countries, but there are about maybe 14 countries out of the 20. Either they have active nuclear power programs or they are considering them. Uh, and of course, Saudi Arabia and Turkey are, uh, are those countries that have already either building or about to build. Thank you. Thank you. One of the uh, advantages, I think, of the, of the SMR from my point of view uh, is the, uh, the way the investor uh, buys it and the risk that the investor is facing compared to a big nuclear power plant. Unless it's a build, own, operate plant like the plants that are currently being built by Rossetum in, in Turkey, uh, a more conventional purchase agreement is you, you're a utility or a power company and you're buying a nuclear reactor, uh, you're kind of stuck with it. There was a reactor in North Carolina that the investors had to say, we've had enough after spending $6 billion and they got no reactor even after spending $6, million, $6 billion. So risk has been a big problem with the uh, big reactors. Uh, you talked about the Finland reactor being uh, way overdue and everything else, uh, Raymond design. Uh, I, it seems to me that with the SMR, it comes out of a factory, put onto a truck, and, and then installed in your site. Uh, it might have a steam generator or it might not, but whatever, it's installed and you turn it on. How, how much difference does that make from the investor's point of view of eliminating our financial risk and, invest, and, and reducing investment, uh, uh, the uh, interest? Costs of the reactor. Uh, anybody can answer that question. Uh, uh, Adnan, Holger, or Bob? I yield to Holger. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Holger. Okay, I mean, obviously, uh, a lower financial risk exposure makes it much more probable for the private sector utility. And expanding, uh, not putting basically the capitalization of uh, the largest uh, utility cannot really cope with the uh, uh, experiences we have seen of $25 billion for work there and so on. That is simply uh, not uh, a sustainable uh, issue. So for that reason, the fact that I can reduce the risk exposure makes the finance, even if you go out to banks and loans, much, much easier with a lower risk premium Right now, uh, there seems to be, in, for a large reactor, if I want some kind of uh, external finance, I have to think of a one to one and a half percent additional risk premium. Now, on the amount we're talking about and the time, that is quite substantial. And I believe that the risk will be further reduced, the perceived risk, at least for the investor, if I can really make use of the benefits of uh, SMR of on site, I mean, on time and uh, on budget construction through the in shop fabrication, move the whole plant uh, to the generation side. And you have much, much shorter and predictable construction periods. And I think these are the things that will make the economics of uh, SMRs viable and also the market will see it. Now, there's one other thing that I think is worth adding, uh, which is on the engineering side. Most of these new SMR designs are simpler. Uh, simpler means they're simpler to manufacture too. Uh, they're not only simpler to operate, which is crucial, but they're simpler to manufacture uh, because the people who are doing these designs know that that's the key to keeping those costs under control. And so they've been concentrating on that right at the center of their engineering development. I know of companies that have drastically modified some of their original ideas because they, uh, they discovered that uh, when they got into it, 
the, uh, the, the simplicity of manufacture, which avoids um, not only errors and delays, but also produces more consistency, was uh, almost the key criterion that would determine success or not. So uh, you, the, the, there's no, it's a promise. It's not delivered yet. It's a promise, but there's a lot of engineering experience to lead us to believe that that, that should be so. And then there's a second thing, which is if, if the idea can be realized that the whole thing is built in a factory, it's shipped on a barge or in a train or, or, you know, or a truck to the site, and then installed on the site, there's much less work on the site, uh, you know, local work, it just gets installed. You have to obviously do, you know, site stuff, but, it, but there's much less of that. And it turns out that in, in some of the important projects, that complicated work on the site was, uh, was where overruns and delays occurred, and that should be minim minim minimized too. So there are several different things coming into play together, which uh, the hope is will all be realized uh, together. Uh, we'll still have to see. Well, I, I may add just uh, to what Bob and Holger said about the cost uh, that you incur to build the reactor on the site. If you take the example of the EPR in Finland, where the cost more than doubled or tripled, uh, and the reason for that is that uh, ED, uh, uh, the, the, the French company, uh, Framatome, uh, that took uh, Ariba, I mean, that basically they took the responsibility of subcontracting in Finland in a market they never worked in. So they ended up and they worked in a different regulator environment. So imagine if this was built in France as an SMR and then just shipped to Finland and then hooked to the power plant. That would have avoided all of these extra costs that materialized it. And so I think for developing countries, for countries like in the Middle East, that even that's much better because if you can have a simpler, it's almost like aeroplanes. You can, aeroplanes can be sophisticated, but they can be assembled and transported. And then you can use them even in a country in the Middle East or in Asia, because you have fine engineers. They can operate them, they can be trained and they will be safe. But the problem is that construction can really bog you down. And this has been demonstrated in developing countries and in industrial countries. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, mean, I have a question for you. We've received a number of uh, questions from our participants or web participants about uh, nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Obviously, we're close to uh, our end of our, our webinar and we don't have time to talk about not proliferation policies or the NPT or anything like that. So I want to boil this down to one question. Have any countries developed nuclear weapons just by having nuclear power reactors or have they had to use other routes to produce fissile materials needed for weapons? Uh, and if not, if they haven't been able to do that, has, have, uh, has uh, the uh, acquisition of power reactors made it easier for countries to undertake the other enrichment activities that was needed? Well, a short answer to the first part of your questions, the nuclear weapon states, all of them, they did not use the nuclear power reactors to produce or to produce the, the, the fuel for their weapons. They opted for different approaches. Now, some other countries in the past, they have tried it, but it didn't work. They abandoned it. But all of the ones, whether it is the five, the P5, or whether it is India and Pakistan and Israel, they had different routes, whether it's the plutonium or the enrichment. Now, of course, if you have a nuclear power reactor, you train people as nuclear engineers, you can divert those nuclear engineers if you wish, but you don't really make take advantage of it. Using a reactor to produce plutonium is though not the good case. Israel, Pakistan, they had different routes. Pakistan did the, uh, the enrichment. Israel did the plutonium from a research reactor. Other countries that wanted to do that, like Iraq, tried to duplicate Israel and build a reactor, research reactor for weapon production, but it was bombed out and so on. So really, North Korea is another example. So really, you don't find an example where a nuclear power did give 
direct connection to nuclear weapons. Maybe Bob Budnitz would like to add to that because you are more of an expert on this than myself. Well, uh, thank you. The only thing I would add is, it is of course true that you could use a power reactor to, to generate the plutonium that would go into a nuclear weapon. You could. Uh, that's not only feasible, but um, it's it, that the technology has been demonstrated. But any country that's starting from scratch, why would you do that? That's just the hardest way. It's just very, very difficult. And furthermore, it'd be hard to hide it. It's very hard to hide that in the in the regime that we're in. And uh, therefore, it just doesn't seem like it's something that could happen. On the other hand, and this is a crucial on the other hand, we have an international regime under the, under the IEA that does inspection and so on to assure that nothing like that would uh, escape our attention. Now, if a country closes the door and says, goodbye, IEA, we don't want you, and then they can go ahead and assure. But that regime is intended to, to accomplish that. And so it just seems like there's not only a technical and a cost reason why you wouldn't do it, but it's very hard to hide it. It's not the way any country that had the North Koreans, for example, um, uh, or I Iran, if it's working on it, I don't know that they are, but um, it, it's not how you would go about it. It, it. It's just really, it's almost the hardest way. Well, thank you both for answering that uh, very sensitive question. And uh, as we come close to the end of our session, I need to thank some people. Uh, first of all, I need to thank uh, Ms. Gula Sabachi, the chairman of Sabachi Holding. She's the founding chairman of Sabanchi University's Board of Trustees and also chairman of ICEC's Board of Directors. Uh, and I need to thank her for support uh, for ICEC and to Sabanchi University, which I'm a uh, part of. I also want to thank Dr. Fatih Burrell, uh, a good friend of mine, executive director of the International Energy Agency and honorary chairman of ICEC's Board of Directors, our institution here. And, uh, and the people that uh, support us, ICAC's board members, uh, I have to thank them for their support. Borison, ENBW, EnergySA, NG, Aaron Holding, Petro PC, Senko Energy, Shell, Sokar, and Zolar Energy. Those are the most prominent energy companies in Turkey, and we really greatly appreciate their support and participation in our programs. I also I want to thank Professor Sikiki for his leadership as president of the World Federation of Scientists. He played an important role in the past to avoid nuclear conflict during the Cold War by bringing together influential nuclear scientists from the United States, the Soviet Union, and the so-called Third World to reduce nuclear weapon tensions. Today, the WFS provides a forum for frank scientific discussion of worldwide emergencies Events as highly as unlikely, but hugely consequential, like uh, a cosmic object colliding with the earth, to everyday problems that we take for granted, such as poverty and disease. The aim of the, of the World Federation of Scientists is to share scientific advances in an interdisciplinary forum to better influence public policies. And of course, I have to thank our great panelists. It's been a real pleasure for me to have this conversation today. And I want to thank all of our online participants who provided the many questions that made our discussion more interesting. We realized that we scheduled today's webinar pretty deep into the summer vacation, and we're grateful that you have taken the time to participate. And this will be ICAC's last webinar until mid-September. Our next webinar will be about the prospects for a hydrogen economy in Turkey. Good evening, and thank you for participating. Thank you.